The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to This House of Musicians with your host, singer, songwriter, and founder of the band, Inner City Outlaws, the Barry Tone Bear, Barry Smith, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board right now, send us an email. Our email address is This House of Musicians at gmail.com. And now, right to your host of this house of musicians, Barry Smith. Hey, welcome, fine listener, to this house of musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. We hope you enjoy the next hour with us as we do our small part to help promote musicians, bands, and venues. Gary Labar, how are you this evening? I'm fine. How are you, sir? I'm very stoked. I'm excited. Uh, We have a legendary blues guitar singer songwriter on the show that everybody knows, Sue Foley. Um, Just amazing to have you, Sue. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Feeling good. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, Have you been playing lately since everything's kind of opened back up? Yeah, we've been uh, really busy, actually. We just did a tour of California and then up to Canada, Western Canada, and then we did South by Southwest last weekend. And I'm still sur- I'm still getting over that. <laughs> no kidding, eh? Lots of lots of tour lots of touring going on. Well, that's amazing. I saw you uh, touring with Buddy Guy and uh, and also um, doing some stuff with Billy Gibbons, Easy Top, and whatnot. So that's just so exciting. Good for you, Sue. Let me start off the uh, interview this evening by asking you how you were influenced by music when you were younger as a little girl were your parents musicians did your older brother have a record or sister have a record collection that vinyl collection that you used to listen to how did it all begin uh not so much begin as becoming a musician but being influenced by music yeah you know it's funny you should say that because it's kind of like all of the above uh wow (laughs) Um, Well, not both of my parents were musicians. My dad was a guitar player and he played uh, Irish and Celtic music and country music, folk music, traditional folk music. Um, So I got a really good sort of teaching that way just because there was so much. I mean, we played around the house a lot. There was always music playing. And then my older brothers, I have three older brothers. They all play guitar. So, I mean, there was just that. And then my sister had a great record collection that what I would get into every time she left the room and I could <laughs> and go play a record. So, yeah, all of the above. There was a lot of music, a lot of guitars. Um, so I had a, a good foundation right at right at the gate, as they say. Absolutely. And what kind of music were you listening to back then? What albums were you throwing on? Well, I mean, when I was a little girl... I was just interested in any kind of music. I thought I loved everything and the radio was my best friend in a way. Um, So popular music of the day, which was been the seventies and eighties. I mean, but mostly the seventies is what I remember. I mean, I remember my older siblings, I was pretty young in the seventies, but I do remember my older siblings had some, a lot of hard rock and a lot of it was blues based like ZZ Top and Led Zeppelin and, um 
Hendrix and Deep Purple. I mean, there was a lot of heavy stuff going on there. And then the Stones, of course, I love the Rolling Stones, Elton John, stuff like that. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Same with all of us as we as we grew up. I mean, our teen teenage years and stuff. It was like you say, the Rolling Stones and whatnot, and that's just the you know we all grew up to the same thing. And to me, it's still the best music. Um, back in the seventies, uh, sixties, seventies, still the best music. Yeah, I still I'm just so glad that I came up at that time. I really I really feel lucky for what I I was able to hear and witness and the whole vibe of that era. I'm just really, I think about it a lot now. I mean, I'm not, not that I'm feeling old, but I'm older and I, I see how things have progressed and I'm always just like, oh, I'm so glad I saw what I did when I saw it, you know. I agree. Absolutely the best era of music was the 60s, 70s, early 80s, possibly. I mean, things started to change in the early 80s, but I think about it a lot too. And that's just because that stuff's gone. I mean, we still have it to listen to, streaming albums, CDs and whatnot. Um, it's, 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 we're lucky enough to still be able to go to record stores and be able to buy vinyl of that old stuff. But compared to a lot of today's music, not that I'm knocking it, um, good for any musician that can you know, get out and play good for them. It doesn't really matter what it is, but like, you know, for me, definitely those were the best years and that those, that music's gone. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel the same way. I mean, we still, like you said, so every time I hear something from that era, I'm, I'm always, you just, you just, your ears just listen up. There's something about the sound of it. I, you know, just recording changed over time and um, more electronics and, you know, I think back then there's just sort of a purity to what it was and um, you can really still hear that in, in, in all those records. So yeah, we're lucky. I, I agree. Definitely lucky to be around and even to see some of those concerts from them. But I love that you said uh, it was so real. Like when they were in the studio playing, like you say, there was not all this technology they were playing like uh, not necessarily live off the floor, but they were playing only like what they had, uh, an amp, a guitar. There wasn't all this other stuff that's that's mixed in. And, and of course, you know, a lot of the techno music today, if that's the right term, is all machines and 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 stuff being played. But anyway, um, it's just, uh, yeah, so I agree with you that that was definitely, and it brings back memories when you hear a Zeppelin song on the radio, because that's when I was raised on country music, but I got into, as a teenager, all that rock stuff. So to hear a Zeppelin or Sabbath song on the radio or Elton John or something, certainly brings back memories of when we were younger sue um when did you start playing guitar what how old were you i was 13 when i when i picked up the guitar i mean i, I always knew i'd be a musician and it just seems so nice really to be oh yeah i always knew it's funny i just always knew i came out of the womb like that when i was a little kid i just was very musical i gravitated to music i thought about music i could remember songs I could, you know, just music just always seemed like the most important thing to me. But when I finally got my hands on a guitar, I was 13. I think it was Christmas. And I asked for one for Christmas from my dad. And he just gave me one of the old beat up guitars that had been lying around the house. Like, take that one, you know. <laughs> there, that one's yours. Go to town. So. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so what you have, had you picked up and played one of your brother's guitars before that or? No, I never had. I didn't really, it wasn't until that time when I really kind of came into focus. And I think it was just, I, I really think it was the beginning of teen angst. Cause it was just like, I need something to get me through the next, <laughs> the next one. Right. Turned yeah. out to be my whole lifetime. <laughs> No, absolutely. I, I get you. And it's such a it's such a release to be able to play music. Um, I've been doing it all my life as well. Have you um, do you remember kind of kind of a, um, uh, a well, a thinking question, I guess, or maybe not. Do you remember the first couple of songs or the first song you learned? Like a lot of people say smoke on the water or yeah. uh, do you remember the first song you learned? Yeah, House of the Rising Sun. I mean, it's got to be one so of So many people ones. say that. <laughs> yes. House, and I think Smoke on the Water was a, very close after that, you know. 
Yeah, and, and House of the Rising Sun, when you got to do that little picking, you know, dun, 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 um, and go through those chords, it's not the easiest song to learn. No, but it's so good for you. And then, then you've got all those chords under your belt. So. Uh, absolutely. Do you remember the first time, I guess you'd be moving ahead a little bit here, but the first time you played live in front of somebody and how you felt? Yeah, I was, um, I think I did my first, I mean, the, the first time I played live in front of somebody, I, I would have been 14 or 15. I mean, we started going to blues jams pretty young. And then I did my first paying gig, like getting paid for a gig at 16. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was that, would have been in, that would have been in Ottawa? Yeah, that was in Ottawa. And uh, I remember everything about it. You know, I was playing a big old arch top guitar that I had that, reminded me of a guitar I saw Memphis Mini holding in a picture. So I bought one of those and I was playing that and got paid a hundred bucks, which wasn't bad for 16. But... <laughs> yeah, no, that's, ama that's amazing. Um, we had Nikki Stringfield from the Iron Maidens on the show and she said she was kind of an outcast from school and her friends and just sat in her room for hours and hours on end playing her guitar and learning stuff. Were you like that too? Yeah, I was completely, um, yeah, I barely had any friends by that point. I mean, I wasn't, you know, the teen years kind of got a little difficult and I didn't really have any friends, which is, was another reason. I think the guitar just came in handy. It was just something I could hold on to and, and really, and really form a bond with and have a friendship with. And, and I was in my room playing guitar my entire teen years. <laughs> my that's, mother would have they were always, Go ahead, sorry. they were teasing me like, when are you coming out of your room or what are you doing up there? You know. And that's great to be that enthralled into it. That's for sure. And you, did you start singing at that time too? No, I didn't really start singing until uh, a few years into it. I mean, I sang as a child and then I got shy as a teen and then I, I broke out into singing. I don't know, I was 16 or 17 again. So you went from, well, you did your first live paying gig when you were 16, and then you went from that to going on stage and actually singing and playing your guitar at the same time. Yeah, it, it was a pretty natural progression. I didn't really want to be a singer at that point. I just thought I'd be a guitar player. And then somebody told me, they said, well, you're not going to sing. You better be one hell of a guitar player. <laughs> so I was like, I said, you're, you might want to try it. I was like, all right, I'll try it. Awesome, and you did. Yeah. yeah, you sure did. Sure. You've, done, you've, you've, you've had such an amazing career. Um, I want to ask you about, uh, let's just step back a little bit. When the first time you came out on stage, I'm always interested to know how you felt. Were you nervous? And of course, we all are, or or to some extent. And then when you realize that people are up dancing or the crowd's into it, it kind of eases your nerves. But um, And do you still get nervous when you go out and play? Yeah, I get nervous at every show. I still get nervous. I, st I always feel like if you get a little nervous, it shows that you actually care. So. Um, That's a great, great point. Yeah, I still do. And I still, and I find that the best way to deal with that is just to prepare, be prepared. And that's, but yeah, I, I was nervous for years and years and years, very nervous. I was extremely nervous and it does, it did let up after a while. Like, now it's just the right amount, you know, excitement, excitement. It's it's definitely excitement as well, for sure. And like I say, once the audience is into it and stuff, then it's, it, it, you know, I guess it becomes a little easier, too, when you have some albums out and you have a name for yourself and they're playing your music on the radio. People, you know, it's 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 hard to go do a show and be booed when you have popularity already. So that might ease a bit of the tension, too. Yeah, and I've never, I was never nervous about being booed or not accepted. I was more nervous just about the whole, like, the whole thing. Like, it's like you get out there, it's got to sound a certain way. It's, the sound can actually really make you nervous because it's, you don't know what it's going to sound like or how it's going to be, how, how you're going to win the crowd over. I, I you know, I, I get nervous now, but it's not like a insecurity of, of anything. I know what I do and I know I'm good and I can handled pretty much any situation barring all the strings falling off my guitar or something but um, <laughs> you know I could handle almost anything so it, it's not that it's just 
it's more just wanting to, you know, you're reading the audience as there's a whole, there's a lot going on when you, when you're stepping on stage and dealing with all this heavy gear and equipment and loud noise and just managing all these factors. So. Agreed. Absolutely. Um, so age 21, you're living in Austin, Texas, and uh, you're recording for Antones, the blues label, Historic Nightclub, and your first release was Young Girl Blues. Okay, tell me how you ended up in, in uh, Austin, Texas. That's just too cool. Well, um, you know, we were all, uh, I was a young blues player. I got into blues by the time I was 15. And uh, there was a really robust blues scene uh, at the time. And that's basically right at the moment Stevie Ray Vaughan broke out and uh, really put blues back on the map. I mean, we were already into blues, but once he broke out, came out of Austin, it was like, well, who's that? And he became, you know, super famous and, and every guitar player wanted to be Stevie Ray, literally. Um, mm -hmm. But it did put Austin on the map for me. And then I saw the fabulous Thunderbirds too. And uh, that Austin sound was just really, really special. It was its own thing. And it was sort of a new, exciting blues sound that I had never really heard played that way. And I really, I really just got enamored with Austin. And I saw other acts from Austin, Angela Straley, and I heard Lou Ann Barton. And uh, I was just enamored with it. So. Um, I always wanted to go there. So it was just in, in the back of my mind constantly at that time. And, and uh, I ended up meeting Clifford Anton in Memphis. We were down there playing uh, with Mark Hummel, the Bay Area harmonica player. He got a stateside from Canada and we were touring with him and Clifford saw me and told me to send him a demo tape. And I got off the road, off tour with Mark and I sent him something and he called me right up and invited me. Liked a, he liked a song I wrote called Gone Blind, which turned out to be on my first album. It was a solo piece. It was kind of a low down blues play, piece. And he, he just couldn't believe there was a little girl in Canada that was playing like Lightning Hopkins style blues. So he, he was just tickled, you know. He loved uh, supporting young artists. Like he loved turning the young artists onto the older people and the legends. So that was his whole modus. You know, he really was a, a very important mentor to me. Yeah, and when you went to Austin and Stevie was just breaking out, did you change the way you played a bit or did you change the sound that you had when you left Canada and went to Austin, started getting into maybe a different sound? Or Yeah, I mean, far... I, I did. I mean, I, I definitely did. I, I did pick up the Texas style, like what they were playing down here and you really can't do that unless you come down and actually play with these players to kind of learn their tricks and watch them and so i learned a great deal and clifford anton was like i said he was a mentor he turned us on to all kinds of records but he'd also put us on stage with all these legendary players he was a, a, oh. he was a really big proponent of that that was a big thing for him was to put so the first weekend i was in austin i sat in with albert collins and Wow. It just went from there. I mean, it was like a kid in a candy store. There were so many great blues artists who, uh, you know, most of them are passed on now. So I feel extra lucky that I had that experience. But he definitely took care of us and, and taught us how to play and what to play and what to listen to. Yeah. Absolutely. And it must have been like out of body experience uh, stepping on stage with some of these people. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like I remember backing up Otis Rush, I and mean, that was insane. You know, Hubert Sumlin, just some of my favorite artists. Albert Collins was just wild. I mean, there's nobody like him. So, yeah, and you learn so much through that, you know, that sort of direct, I always call it like direct transmission, like osmosis. You know, you're, you're standing right next to this person's amp and you feel their energy. You know, there's something that sort of magical that happens in that moment. Absolutely. And it would make you be played better uh, as well, I would believe, um, uh, you know, because you're, you're playing with these people and, you, you know, you're, you're now, to me, you'd be on a different level than, a, than playing a regular little pub. Not that there's anything wrong with playing little regular pubs, but it's certainly 
Uh, and then you probably aim to be better. Well, yeah, it lifts you up. I mean, everybody you play with, um, I mean, the better the caliber of musician you're working with, the better it, it lifts you up higher. Um, so yeah, we, we got a lot of, onto a lot of coattails there. <laughs> I learned a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good for you. And yeah, I have to ask you this. What was the, this was, you know, a, a while back, Austin, Texas. Um, what was the partying like? Party? Oh, did you party? Oh yeah, we partied. We were 20. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. I was 21 when I got to Austin. I was 21 and yeah, well, we partied like crazy. We we're kids. So That's we had, awesome. we had a blast. I mean, everything was a party. Um, and we just we just had fun. I mean, you know, we just had a lot of fun, and we were really in love with the whole everything. So it was just, it was truly a wonderful experience. I'm sure it was, and and uh, like, like the reason I'm asking about partying was it the all night thing? Let's go out with this 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 you know musician, famous or not, and let's go out and probably after hour clubs partying all night. Um, yeah, just uh, just amazing. Yes, there was a lot of after after hour stuff going on. For sure, and I remember uh, I'm, when I had my band, we play uh, small pubs only, uh, uh, the Soho Tavern, Kennedy and Eglinton in Toronto, and then pack up at the end of the night and go down to the Matador and play from two to five. Um, at the time, it was, I wouldn't say stressful, but hectic. But now I look back and she goes, geez, I wish I was kind of, you know, I miss those days for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty wild. Yeah, <laughs> More uh, I'm sure I'm sure it was not not so wild now, though, just uh, for you, I, I wouldn't imagine at this point. Well, you know, I, I'm older now, so I don't party. Uh, I don't really party anymore. I mean, I do party, but I don't party like that. We all we are all in that same boat. That's for sure. Um, definitely party when you're younger. Sue, I want to play one of your songs here. I want to come back and talk about it. I love this album. Um, and the song I want to play is called Two Bit Texas Town. Uh, I was sent a folder of your songs and these are the two I picked. Um, love the guitar playing. Love your voice. Um, is this a song that you wrote, Two Bit Texas Town? No, this was written by um, blues singer Angela Straley from Austin. Uh, actually, originally from Lubbock, Texas, but she was a big part of the Austin sound and Austin scene. She helped build the Antones nightclub. I mean, she helped kind of bring a lot of those older artists down from Chicago and stuff. Uh, so she had a big hand in that, but she's a wonderful singer. and This is her song. I'm going to have to look her up after this interview for sure. Folks, I have Sue Foley on the show this evening. The amazing Sue Foley. We're going to hear um, a song off her, I believe, latest album, Two Bit Texas Town. This House of Musicians radio show right here on Reality Radio 101. <laughs>
Hey there, it's Ian from Five Paddles Brewing Company. We're located in Whitby, Ontario, just off of Highway 401. Since we've opened, we've brewed over 300 different styles of beers. Whether you like lagers, stouts, IPAs, or flavored beers, we've always got something new and intense available at our tasting room and for take-home in cans and bottles. If you're not sure what to get, we've got friendly and knowledgeable staff to help you out. We've been lucky enough to collaborate with Harley-Davidson Riders of Canada to make a beer that raises money for Sick Kids Charity. Proceeds from every can purchased is donated directly to Sick Kids. Check out our online store at fivepaddlesbrewing.ca to see what we have available today. We have free local delivery to your door and more options available for the rest of the province. We're always adding new beer to our online store at fivepaddlesbrewing.ca. If you wanted to come down in person to pick up your craft beer, we're located at 1390 Hopkins Street in Whitby. It's a great place to have a cold beer in a relaxed setting. Help out a great charity and drink some great craft beer from Five Paddles Brewing Company. At Classy Chassis and Cycles, we have the absolute best motorcycles available for sale and the best live music for your entertainment. It doesn't get any better than this. Get your motorcycle serviced by our V-Twin Performance Specialists. And always, 100 motorcycles in stock. Hungry while looking? Try our delicious on-site food truck meal specials. It's all happening at Classy Chassis and Cycles. Call us today at 888-292-8305. That's 888-292-8305. Or visit our website, usedhd.ca. Or send us an email. Our email address is info at usedhd.ca classy chassis and cycles motorcycles music and food all for the motorcyclists in your life did you know that on top of listening to this house of musicians live every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern right here on reality radio 101.com that you can now watch this house of musicians tv on youtube Videos of our in-person interviews with Canadian music industry legends and insiders are always being added. Podcasts of all of our past radio shows are also being added, just in case you missed one. So visit YouTube and search for This House of Musicians TV, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Welcome back to This House of Musicians with your host, singer, songwriter, and founder of the band, Inner City Outlaws, the Barry Tone Bear, Barry Smith, right here on Reality Radio 101. Send us an email. Our email address is thishouseofmusicians at gmail.com. Keep me riding. And now, right back to your host of this House of Musicians, Barry Smith. Hey, welcome back, folks. I have the amazing Sue Foley, a legendary blues guitarist, singer-songwriter on the show this evening. Sue, I just want to ask you, 2-Bit Texas Town, how you chose that song to put on your album. Barry, I'm going to, I think, Sue, we're going to let her back in. I think she got disconnected. Okie doke. And Sue, are you back? I'm back. There you go. I don't know what happened, but here I am. We don't know what happened, <laughs> but Barry's got a question for you. Go ahead, Bear. Well, we listened to your song. We did the ads. I'm glad that you returned. Um, I just wanted to ask, we heard 2-Bit Texas Town, how you... Um, how you ended up putting that on your album, why you put that on your album, that song. Oh, I put it on because, um, well, first of all, I thought it was a really cool song. I love how she referenced all those blues heroes of ours, Jimmy Reed and Muddy Waters, and sort of tells the story of uh, when she first heard blues music. Um, and she's talking about growing up in Lubbock, Texas, and 
of course, I didn't grow up in Lubbock. I don't have that experience. But when I came to Austin, it kind of was a, like a small town. And I, I sort of relate her song and her experience to those formative years I had in Austin. So that's how I kind of just gravitated towards it. I just thought it was such a cool song. So it tells a very cool story. It does indeed. And how long, how long did you spend in Austin? How long were you down there having such a great time? Uh, I was there for almost a decade. I mean, I recorded four albums for Antones. I mean, they put us out on the road, so we ended up being on tour pretty much almost the whole time. But we did land back in Austin between tours and get to play with all, all our heroes down at the club. Um, but yeah, I was, I was here from 90 to almost like 98, and then I returned home. And now I'm back in Austin. I've been back. Oh, okay, cool. I've been back for cool. almost four years. Good for you. And so you're still. Uh, I already asked you. You're still playing around in Austin and whatnot. Um, do you have uh, like a big, a major tour coming up where you're going to come, maybe come back to Canada to play? Um. Yeah, we were like I said, we were just in the west. We were up on the island in Vancouver, and then now we're heading. To the east, we're going to be in Toronto, I believe, April 13th, Belleville on the 14th. We're going to be at Ottawa Blues Festival in July. Um, I'm going to be in Alberta also in April. And we're going to be, we've got some dates with ZZ Top in Alberta and BC, I think, in April. So, yeah, there's lots of stuff in Canada. I'm super, super excited to be back. Great. We're super excited to have you back because my wife and I are avid concert goers and we're going to come see you. So oh, I look forward. Uh, absolutely. I will look forward to seeing you. Um, uh, I did a promo up for you for social media. And on the promo, I said, uh, Sue spent decades on the road, faithfully carrying Pinky, um, her Pinky Paisley Fender Telecaster guitar. Being a guitar collector myself, I'm excited to ask her about Pinky because if a guitar could only talk, I can imagine the stories that Pinky could tell. Tell me, I know, I know this guitar means the world to you. Obviously, I see it in every picture, lots of videos that you've done. Tell me how, how that guitar came to be and uh, and why you love it so much. Well, I got that guitar in. Uh probably around 88 in Vancouver. I was living in Vancouver and I uh, bought it right off the shelf, right off the rack. They had just uh, reissued those Paisley tellies. I'd never really seen one in person. I know James Burton was one of the first people to put the Paisley telly on the map, but I, this was like, you know, they had just reissued them and there was, they were there in Long and McQuaid in Vancouver. I, I went in and there was two of them hanging and I was like wow it was like almost like a thump on the head moment where it's like I have to have that guitar <laughs> and I was like uh I forget was it Wayne's World or something when he did that and it's like I have to have this you know um but that was sort of the feeling and then uh I, I told my boyfriend about it at the time and he actually brought it home uh, I think wow. on Christmas and gifted it to me but i i had to make the payments he made the first payment <laughs> I, was, I was i was sue i was gonna say that's a good way to keep your girlfriend but now i'm having second thoughts <laughs> no no it was actually really good because i i think because sure. I, I paid it off myself it really was my guitar and so that guitar was with me uh through every gig i mean we were traveling around all the time i learned to play on that guitar i learned to really hone my chops I mean it kind of became my trademark because it's so distinct looking but it was a really you know it still is a great guitar I played it on this album uh it was the only thing you're hearing on that album is Pinky the original Pinky um so I played it on every album and on gigs for 30 years you can imagine the amount of sweat and blood and energy and soul and just everything you put into an instrument um, like that. So it's just really special. It's just kind of got my vibe and, and, uh, I don't travel with it anymore because it's kind of precious and I'm just afraid of something happening to it at this point. But so I have two new pinkies that are very close to the original pinky. They're just brand new. And I have those with me. 
and you had somebody make those up special for you? Well, I, I bought, I actually got them. They were gifted to me. One was gifted to me by Jimmy Vaughn and the other one was gifted to me by Billy Gibbons. So one's called That's, the Jimmy. Wow. It's called the Billy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I no know. And you can tell them apart. <laughs> yes, I can. They've got uh, slightly different setups. So, yeah. Good. Speaking of uh, Billy Gibbons and Jimmy Vaughn, 2018, you did a, a solo artist album called The Ice Queen, and there were, you had featured guest appearances by Billy Gibbons uh, and Jimmy Vaughn, uh, which is incredible. How did you get those guys to come in and play on your album? Well, our producer, Mike Flanagan, actually set that up. Um, he was cool. working, He plays with Jimmy Vaughn. He plays B3, him and B3 with Jimmy and Billy. Uh, so they're friends of his and, and uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know them very well, but now I know them quite well and have played with them a bunch of times. We have a band that we all play together in now called The Jungle Show. That, that happens around Christmas time. Um, so, yeah, so they've just become friends over the years, uh, but it was Mike Flanagan who actually formed the introduction and set it up. Yeah, and you uh, referenced earlier that you were influenced by ZZ Top being a blues player when you were younger, and now here you are hanging out with Billy Gibbons. I mean, I know. I, thought it. <laughs> I think about that all the time because I think, you know, probably the first blues I ever heard was probably ZZ Top. My brothers were always playing ZZ. So there you go, full circle. Just, just incredible. Good for you. Like I said, it's something, I'm sure sometimes it has to be a little bit of an out-of-body experience, but great for you because those guys are just amazing players and uh, deserve the recognition that they get. ZZ Top and Jimmy Vaughn, um, and Stevie Ray, they all deserve that recognition. Uh, they're just amazing, wonderful players and very creative uh, as far as singing, songwriting, and, and especially ZZ Top. Uh, they have their own style of, of music and their own sound. You can relate it to blues or rock or, you know, some of it's even a little poppy, but uh, just an incredible band. Yes, agreed. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, love those guys. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, where am I here? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, I want to ask you, I put you on the spot just a little bit here. I want to know a crazy story. I'm sure you have a lot of crazy stories that have happened to you uh, on, a, on a tour bus, on stage, on a plane, just something to do musically. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's crazy enough. Uh, but not crazy enough. It's very exciting that you have these guest stars on your albums and whatnot coming on and playing. But uh, just um, I'm interested to know something crazy. I ask all my artists. It's one of the best parts of the show. That something crazy that's happened to you. Um. Yeah, I always get put on the spot with stuff like this, and I can't think of anything. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, it's, it's that to kind of. Going Go down to Austin the way I did with Clifford Anton calling me was pretty crazy. Um, you know, uh, shoot. I don't know. Like, I feel like it's all been a yeah. little, I feel like it's all been a little crazy sometimes. But Absolutely. We had, we had one artist that said that they had a, an, an audience member throw a snake up on stage that totally freaked them out. So that's why I just like to, find out crazy stories yeah i don't know let me think about it I, don't, I can't think of anything believe it or not i know there is because i've been in the business my whole life but um it's funny <laughs> like i'm not good at getting being put on the spot with stuff like this that's okay let's move on no worries at all um if you're driving to the store to go buy some groceries let's just say per se who's CD would you be listening to? Who do you listen to now? Do you listen to any of the newer stuff or do you still stick to the, the old classic blues and rock? Um, I kind of vacillate. Sometimes I'll just put on Sirius XM, Bluesville, or maybe the Jazz Station. Um, I'll put on Willie's Roadhouse. I love old country music. Uh, so traditional country music is always a, a blast. But yeah, I, I have Sirius XM, so I listen to Soul Town and I listen to classic 
So the classic soul, classic country, classic blues and classic jazz. Um, and then I like the Frank Sinatra channel too, because it's got that great American songbook. I love all that stuff. I, I can keep going back to any of that stuff for, for a reference. And, I, and I, it's always fun to hear what's coming out new. I mean, Bluesville plays a lot of new stuff. Um, so I can keep track of newer artists. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly kind of, when I'm just actively listening, I'm, I'm usually working on something. So it's usually something I'm doing specifically for a purpose. Uh, I hate to say I don't listen for pleasure, but I listening to music is almost like work for me at this point. So I'm, I'm usually obsessed about something for some reason. And so I've been listening to this classical musician named Ida Presti, who's a, it's, it's just a recording I found of hers from the 1930s and she was a wonderful guitar player. So I've been listening to her lately just as a sort of an active listening thing. But, you know, I, I go all over the place, but I love just traditional music in general. Yeah, and you could, you know, you could be influenced by different people as well. And I'm not necessarily saying take their stuff and play it, but it gets inside you when you get into somebody, uh, deeply into somebody, you're listening to them and you go, wow, this is really good. And it can kind of influence you in your playing and songwriting, too. Uh, do you agree with that? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I think everything I'm, I'm actually can be very selective as to what I listen to just because I always find everything we listen to kind of goes into us in some respect. Um, it, it sure does. Yeah. Your creative writing process for me, I will pick up my guitar, play a riff and go, wow, I like that riff Record it on my phone and maybe come back to it. And I probably have a hundred, maybe more on my phone and then come back to it if I don't write the song right then and there, I'll come back to it and use it to write a song, just maybe a, a 30 second riff that I played on my guitar. Uh, what's your creative uh, writing process like? Do you write the words first and put music to it? Or do you use your guitar to, I mean, I guess a lot of times you have a story to tell something that might've happened to you or, you know, express how you feel about your boyfriend or your friends. Um, but I'm just curious to know how you put your songs together. Well, it varies. I, I sometimes I have a concept. A lot of times I work from a concept, like uh, I'll think of something and I'll think, oh, that's an, like the Ice Queen, for instance. That's a concept. Um, how did you come up with that? And I just thought about an Ice Queen. I was just thinking about the Ice Queen. I thought, oh, the Ice Queen people call women queens and then I thought about it's funny because I'm from Canada and I thought oh I could probably make a play on that because my Canadian thing and then the, working on the whole idea the riff of the concept right and using the concept mm -hmm. sort of using the concept to jump off of like uh on our new album Pinky's Blues there's a song called Hurricane Girl that's another one where I thought about there was a hurricane that had come through Austin and and I thought, oh, that was kind of an interesting idea. A girl that's like a hurricane, you know, like ripping through somebody's town, you know? So, so I think a lot from those con conceptual ways. And then I'll, I'll kind of think about, I mean, I often, when, I, when I'm working out a song, I work with my guitar in my hands and I kind of riff on the musical ideas you know, and I'll, I'll let the sort of the music kind of lead. But a lot of times I'll start with a concept that I'll have already kind of mapped out in my mind somehow, maybe jotted down a few notes, maybe made a few, you know, associations with. Um, and I kind of just riff on it like that. And I let them, then I, when I'm actually writing, writing, I usually have my guitar there and I'm and letting that, the music kind of pull out the rest of it, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely makes sense. Um, so you, uh, are you working on, I know this, your album Pinky's Blues came out in 2018, did it? Uh, or 2020? It came out, the Ice Queen came out in 2018. The, I, the Pinky's Blues came out in 2021. 2021. I seen on your guitar strap, you have Ice Queen written on it. Is it something that people call you like uh, as a nickname or? 
Yep, they do now. Cool. <laughs> do, yeah, well, they see it on your guitar strap. <laughs> yeah. And the song, of course. Yep. It, Good for it you. worked. That's... It worked because, you know, it's on It worked. Canada. I'm from Ottawa, the land of ice. I mean, we have a lot of ice up there, freezing rain, icy roads. <laughs> it's just. Me you know, too. We're near we're near Toronto. I I know what you're talking about and yeah. been here all my life, so I know exactly. Actually, I do snow removal for a living in the winter, so I know exactly what you mean. Um, Sue, let's play another song off of Pinky's Blues. Um, this one's called "Stop These Teardrops," and then I want to come back and ask you about this song. Let's do that. Folks, I have the wonderful Sue Foley on the show this evening. We're going to hear her song. Uh, where'd it go? It's right here. Stop These Teardrops. And uh, we'll be right back right here on this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. At Roof Smith Canada, we have over 30 years of professional experience offering free quotes on your flat roofing, shingled roofing, and repair concerns. We offer a five page quote package, which includes two pages of references for your peace of mind. 
all at very competitive prices. And for all of our roofing jobs, we use only the absolute best quality roofing materials, bar none. Servicing the Durham, Clarington, Toronto, Peterborough, Port Hope, Coburg, and surrounding areas, our employees are friendly, courteous, and we maintain a no-smoking policy on your roof. Roof Smith Canada is fully insured, and owner Barry Smith is working at each and every job and will service your roof as if it were his own. Cleanup is always immaculate, so what are you waiting for? Please call Barry today at 416-917-8049. That's 416-917-8049. Be sure to request to join our Facebook group to view all of our jobs that we have completed and read reviews from very satisfied customers. Email us, RoofSmithCanada at Hotmail.com. RoofSmithCanada, a proud owner-operator company that always allows you to contact us even after the job is done. Hi, I'm Al Joins from Discovery, Toronto's independent music showcase, available exclusively through SoundCloud, and you're listening to This House of Musicians with your rockin', blues-talkin', man with a plan, Barry Smith on Reality Radio 101. Hi, this is Sam Reed from Glass Tiger, and you're listening to This House of Musicians radio show at Reality Radio 101. Welcome back to This House of Musicians radio show. With your host, singer, songwriter, and founder of the band, Inner City Outlaws, the Barry Tone Bear, Barry Smith, right here on Reality Radio 101. Request to join our Facebook page, This House of Musicians, and our Instagram page, at T-H-O-M. And now back to your host of this house of musicians, Barry Smith. Hey, folks, as Gary says, welcome back to this house of musicians radio show. I have the wonderful Sue Foley on the show this evening, and we just heard stop these teardrops. Sue, please tell me about this song. That song was uh, written by um, another wonderful singer out of Austin. Lavelle White, Miss Lavelle White, and uh, she recorded that for Duke Records way back in, I think, the 50s or early 60s. So that song's been around for a while. It was also covered by Luann Barton on one of her albums. It's just a great sort of standard Texas uh, cool song. I mean, I just fell in love with that song a long time ago and so just had to do it. Absolutely, and I really heard uh, substantial Stevie Ray Vaughan tone and uh, finger picking style uh, in that song um, could just be me but um, I'm just wondering if, if maybe of course you're influenced by Stevie Ray a bit but uh, I was definitely hearing some of that in that song with you playing guitar yeah well thank you I mean it, it's sort of a stylistic thing that you'll hear you'll hear and that really is the Austin sound that I was talking about that you know Stevie kind of put it on the map but really there was a whole bunch of players who had ha helped develop that sound um so it was stevie it was his brother jimmy it was denny freeman and Derek o'brien and uh more obscure people like bill campbell you you might not have heard of but there was a whole scene here that that sound that's why i came to austin be was because of that sound and it wasn't just stevie but it was just this whole thing it was like a a whole thing that got just just made here so Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about your Juno Award. Uh, that must have been exciting. Oh, yes, that was great. Um, we're up for another one this year. So knock on wood, but it's wonderful, wonderful to get. Absolutely. 
sorry to cut you off. Yeah, it's just great to be, you know, noticed and, and given this kind of adulation or whatever from our fans and our friends and people in the industry. So uh, the Pink Blues album has done really well for us. And um, we're just tickled that, that everything's working out the way it is. We're, we're nominated for a Juno. We're nominated for, I think, four or five Maple Blues Awards in Toronto. And we're nominated for three Blues Music Awards in Memphis. So it's pretty good. Good for you. And you've already won 17 Maple Blues Awards for Best Female Guitarist, Vocalist, Songwriter. Um, just an incredible uh, accolade for, for you. Um, so congratulations on that. Thanks. Thank you. Sue, it's been an absolute pleasure. I wish I could talk to you longer. Love the stories. Before we go, there's a segment of the show I like to do called, Well, Gary Labar, what do you think? What do I think? I love Sue's work. I can tell you that right off the bat. I love I love the Austin sound. I always did. But I like that Sue brings out some of the older bluesy type of stuff and puts a new take on it, something fresh, you know, so it's exciting about that. And you know what? I When I was listening to uh, Two Bit Texas Town, you know, I don't know if Sue's going to like this comment, but... <laughs> Her, her, uh, her, don't ruin it now. No, nah, I know, but <laughs> no, just kidding. The vocal, the way she sang that vocally, it sounded like Cindy Lauper, like uh, like some of the stuff Cindy Lauper has sung in the past. I mean, I love Sue's voice; it's, it's incredible. Um, it reminds but, me of Bonnie Raitt. Yeah, Bonnie Raitt, of course. But there was just something about it. If if I didn't know this was a song by Sue. You know, I'm I'm comparing, you know, a lot of uh, stuff that Cindy would have done, you know, um, and it just there was a little bit of a connection there. But that's just me. What do I know? I'm I'm old. Right. So. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, Sue, I wish you the best, you know, especially now that covid has is lightening up a little bit. And I hope that you can get out there and tour again and, and do some great stuff. So good luck to you. Well, thanks very much. And I, I'm not offended by the Cindy Lauper comment. I think she's fantastic. So thank you. And uh, I never thought of it that way, but she's a, she's a wonderful singer. So there's no, uh, no harm, no foul there. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, you're not in trouble, Gary. Nope. Well, good. That's good. Very good. Sue, thank you so much for, for taking the time to spend with us. Look forward to seeing you in April and uh, wish you all the best. Um, I'd like to, you know, uh, keep following your progress and get you back on the show in a year or two and see what you've done from now till then. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And we'll see you up in Canada. You sure will. And to the listener, I say thank you for being here. Always dance and sing. And let the music bring your soul to the surface for all the world to see. Until next time, have a shuffle your feet kind of week. And good night. You've been listening to This House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. Thank you for listening to This House of Musicians with your host, singer-songwriter and founder of the band, Inner City Outlaws, the Barry Tone Bear, Barry Smith, right here on Reality Radio 101. It's gonna be a classy day.